Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. Cool. Well, happy to be here today. Got to be going. Third service. Woo! You guys are pumped. First two services have been awesome. I think you guys got some extra energy, though, because you got that extra sleep, so it's going to be great. Um, But today, I want to start kind of setting the stage for what we're going to read, giving us kind of a lens through which to kind of to read this through. Not that this is going to change the truth of it, but it's going to help us to start figuring out how we're going to apply this in our lives. And the question I kind of want to pose for us this morning is, do you feel in need of rescue today? Right? Do you feel like you're in need of rescue in some way? Now again, uh, I use the word rescue and it often to me it conjures up some like extreme examples like if you're drowning, you need to be rescued. If your house is on fire, you need to be rescued. Or you know, something where it's like immediate life-threatening, something's coming at you, you're in the middle of something and you're like, I need rescue. Now again, probably we're not in that immediate life-threatening situation right now. But Maybe there's something, and it's maybe not even threatening your physical life, but maybe there's something that is a threat in your life that's coming at you, right? Maybe it's maybe you have an antagonistic relationship with someone in your life who they're just constantly beating you down. There's something that you just keep running up against. Maybe there is a physical sickness. Maybe it's not necessarily terminal, but maybe it's a, a physical ailment, something that you're just coming up against that's still taking all of your energy. That's that's you're fighting. Maybe there's, again, like just life, financial situations. Maybe there's that job that you lost, the one that you want that you haven't gotten. Maybe there's the debt that's been, who knows? But like all of us in some sense probably could identify some area where we're like, you know, if I was going to be honest, I, I need someone to step in and, and rescue me in this situation. I, I, I don't have the ability to, to, to fight this off by myself. I, I don't know how to overcome this threat that's against me or this situation that I'm in. So we're, we're all here to, to probably some extent, you know, you're either open to the Lord, you're interested in understanding who Jesus is, or maybe you've been walking with him for years. And so we'd say, well, when we come up against those enemies, those threats, we'd say, well, I know I just need to trust God. And I'm like, okay, I need to trust God with this, with this problem. But isn't it really that easy? I mean, it's easy to throw out there. And even as Jesus followers, like, you know it's the right thing. I know I can trust God. But it still seems hard. And we want to start thinking about why is it hard to trust God? So a couple things that I was thinking of that I think make it hard to trust is, number one, there's like, I think we can have a fear of our opposition, so whatever is in front of us, whatever is coming at us or whatever we've put ourselves into, I think we can be afraid of that. And, and now sometimes you, know, you might get the idea that, oh, you should never be afraid. Like, don't be like, there's sometimes legitimate things to be afraid of, right? Again, if you're stuck on a life raft in the middle of the ocean after your, you know, ship just sank, you should kind of legitimately fear for your life. Like that is a, that is not something you'd go, oh, you're just a coward. Get over it. Like, no, no. Real situation, you need to be afraid of this. This is real consequences. So sometimes what's coming at us is real, and it's not that we should ignore it, but it's, it's fear-invoking because of the unknown, because of the size of this problem, because of the frequency, whatever it is. I think we can fear it, but I think we fear it because that's what we see in front of us all the time. This is all I can see day after day after day after day. This is all I can feel day after day after day after day. This is all that's around me in these relationships. And that's, that's all that we see. And I think we can fear the opposition. That makes it hard to trust. I think another thing that makes it difficult is a lack of experiences with God. So when we say, well, I should trust God with X problem, well, we're like, but I've never had X problem before and I've never seen him fix problem X for someone else. I've seen him fix Y and Z, but I've never seen him fix X. So you're like, this relationship, we're like, well, God has fixed so many relationships. Yeah, but he's, he's not, you know, he's not in this family. I've never seen him fix this family's problems. I've never seen him solve this medical crisis because it's a new diagnosis and and I I don't know anyone who's had this before. Or maybe you've just, you, you don't know Jesus that well. You're either young in your faith or you're like, 
I just, I just don't have a history with God. I'm new to this. I don't know how much I can trust him. And another thing that I think makes it hard is misplaced expectations. And I think this is a, a difficult one for all of us is that we look at the threat that's coming at us, we look at a problem in our lives, and we say, God, I can trust you, I know you're, con- I know you're capable, I know you've done things not even like this, maybe this is new, but I know you can do it. And if you're gonna rescue me, it's gonna look like this. And you're gonna say, well, I know God can do this, and it's going to look like this. Now, it's good to have that kind of confidence, But when we say, but it has to look like this, now we're starting to tell God how he's supposed to operate. And we're limiting ourselves to saying, well, the way that I see it working, the best type of saving, the best type of rescue that would happen, it would be this. And so God would do it this way. And we're we're assuming that God thinks like we do. And we're limiting God to the only only to the solution that we can see, not to maybe the solution that he has in mind. So I think our expectations play a big factor into this. So today, I think in in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read probably a top 10, maybe top 5 most famous Bible story. I mean, it's one that a 5-year-old can get something out of, which is awesome, which is I think was why what what speaks to the truth and the validity of God's word is like you could be 5 years old and you could get what David and Goliath is about. Or you can be 85 years old and still get something that you need to learn today. But we're going to see in this story someone who shows us how God works to rescue his people, albeit in an unlooked for and maybe unorthodox way. So to catch us up a little bit, the context in 1 Samuel is like if you look in chapters 8 through 15, you get the narrative of King Saul. He's the first king of Israel. They didn't have one. They wanted one kind of inappropriately, but God said, I'm going to give you a king, made King Saul the king, and he was kind of reluctant, but then he turned out to be okay. Like he was physically impressive. He actually had some good victories. God used him. It was actually looking up. And then after a while, he started making some bad decisions. And it was decisions when you see he didn't obey God's direct commands and instructions and he kept doing it often it was out of fear like the two times that we see it was well I was afraid of the people they were restless well I was afraid of the the enemy was coming it was taking too long and so but anyway he he disobeys and God rejects him as king says you're not going to be king anymore I'm going to look for someone else and then we get chapter 16 chapter 16 introduces us to David This is when the prophet Samuel goes and looks for David, and he's literally overlooked in the sense of David's got all these brothers who are bigger, maybe more impressive, kind of, oh, that's a good-looking guy. And God directs Samuel. He says, no, 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 I'm looking at different qualities. Don't just look on the outside. I'm looking for something else. And he anoints David, the youngest, probably smaller because he's younger and this kind of stuff. And not to say David didn't look good. Like it said, David was a handsome young guy, kind of strapping fit. Like he's a good guy, but he's just not the most impressive, obvious pick. God had something else in mind. And also just addressing like he starts working for King Saul. He starts uh, kind of playing some music when Saul would be overcome by these evil spirits. And it's interesting, the servants who pick out David for Saul's service recognize something about David, which brings up kind of a weird chronology. In chapter 16, one of them says, well, I've seen a son of Jesse who plays the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. Well, how did you know that? Well, it, it seems like, because also when you get to chap, the end of chapter 17, Saul asks a question again, who is this guy? Whose son is he? Well, he's David, son of Jesse. Bring him to me. And it's like this new meeting, which if you read it, you're like, Saul, are you cuckoo? This guy's been playing for you for like, I don't know how long. But it, it could just be that the biblical writer is going, okay, I'm going to introduce David in this way, give you a little bit of snapshot of what he does with Saul. And now I'm going to backtrack and tell you where we really come into the story. So out of place chronology in the biblical text doesn't necessarily mean contradiction, it's false, ignore it. It could just be the author had a different intention when he ordered the events that he put in the Bible. So we're caught up, we're gonna get ready, we're gonna dive into chapter 17, 
We're gonna see how God will choose to bring about the rescue of his people. But as we do that, let me pray and ask God just to, to help us see clearly. So Heavenly Father, uh, I pray that you would um, communicate your truth through me, that I thank you that we get to open your word, that you have a written account of all of your, I mean, so many dealings with your people throughout history, and, and we can see who you are because of that. I pray that we would learn from their experiences with you so that we can apply it to our lives and be changed. Please make us more like you because of what we read. In your name we pray. Amen. So, chapter 17, we get to see in verses one through seven that they're facing a threat and the threat is real. Because like, that's one of the things we think about when we're looking at kind of problems we're coming against. Sometimes we kind of downplay it and be like, maybe it's not so bad. Like, no, no. They're not just afraid because they're a bunch of cowards. This is real here. So chapter 17, verse one. It says, now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Demim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, the Israelites occupied another with a valley between them. So like classic, like cool movie setup, army on one side, army in another, valley between them, like cool. But let's check out why the Israelites are a little afraid here. So it says, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. Now pause here. The Philistine army we know is actually pretty formidable. Like they have dealt some serious blows to the Israelite army. I mean like major victories that the Philistines have had. But then recently the Israelites have had some victories against the Philistines. So it seems like the Philistine tacticians are like, okay, We've done head to head, we win sometimes, but sometimes they just destroy us for no good reason. Like the last time, it was like two guys came up over a hill and we got wiped. So let's try a different strategy. They assemble their lines and they go, we're gonna, we're gonna challenge them to single combat. And apparently this wasn't an uncommon practice in the ancient world, like you could have one representative of your army and one representative come out, fight, winner take all. So that's what they're doing. But let's see his description. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So this guy is big. I mean, I looked up just to see nowadays like what the Guinness Book of World Records is for like kind of tallest strongman type deal. And so they have like tallest professional bodybuilders right now. The tallest guy is this Dutch guy. He's seven foot two. He has no genetic disorders. He is just huge, jacked, and fit. And you look at him and he's like, he does this and everyone fits underneath his arms. Seven foot two. It's fun. You go look him up. He makes like, he makes Vin Diesel look tiny. Like, really, you see the size comparison? It's funny. Now, there's some discrepancy about exactly how tall Goliath is. The Greek translation of the Old Testament maybe put him more in the high six-foot range, somewhere in there, because there's a maybe the Greeks were interpreting the way the ancient Hebrew measurements worked out. But I think I kind of favor the nine-foot, not just because it tells a better story, although I think God likes telling awesome stories, but think about how... how strong he has to be for his armor. And Joel, get the measurements. I've got a prop to show you in a second, but like when it said his, his armor, his scale armor weighed 5,000 shekels, that's about 125 pounds. Let's even say you're 6'8", six, 6'5", six, somewhere like high, so like carrying 125 pounds. If anyone has military experience or you've gone like backpacking and carry, carrying like a rucksack that's got like 50, 60 pounds, like you can move, but you're not gonna be agile. You're not gonna be super mobile. You're like, this guy can carry 125 pounds and still get the job done in battle. Now I'm saying six foot, seven foot, you might be able to do that, but I think nine foot maybe makes that more realistic. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you why here just to get a good perspective on what nine feet is. So I have this high-tech measuring stick here that Sean and I put together. So this is my friend Goliath. 
And that's nine feet. We measured that up. I mean, we just cut it off at nine feet. We had to add that just because, you know, he's happy to be here. <laughs> he likes his life fighting people and killing them. But this is nine feet tall. So I'm six foot two. Let's imagine the average Israelite person is less than six feet. So probably fives. Generous, let's go mid fives. My wife is like five five or so. She comes up to about here on me. So let's go there. Like that's generous, you know, average. That's a big dude. And what is this? Like if you actually imagine like a body attached to this, what is this? His, his like hip? Is that his waist? This is his leg? Oh my gosh. I mean, if he stuck it out to kick, like you, you couldn't get close. I was talking to someone else earlier. Think about his arm reach. His reach, his wingspan, like your wingspan is supposed to be about your height. You know, there's a chest in the middle of it. But still, his arm's what, probably four feet long? Four feet? That, that's crazy. And then he's got a spear. I mean, he's got a javelin that you'd throw, and he's got a spear. He can use that to lunge at you. If the spear adds another six, seven feet just of reach, that's like, that's 10 feet you can't get close to. And when it said the spear point weighed 600 shekels, you looked that up, that's about 15 pounds. Pick up a 15 pound dumbbell and try to throw it at someone. That's not easy. This dude's got to be huge. And then he can use that and lunge at you. Like, oh my gosh. There's, it is not without reason the Israelites are afraid. And again, like this is where we can look at like, oh, there were just a bunch of cowards and David was the only brave one. I don't know. I think they were realistic. They saw something that was real, that was terrifying. And you see their reaction. In verse 11, he's, he's been coming out. He comes out, he shouts at him, he calls him out, he's challenging him. And verse 11 says, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. They're not just a bunch of cowards who just, you know, had no faith and were like, I mean, now they have a problem of faith, but like they were looking at a real dangerous threat in front of them and going, I have no idea how I'm supposed to fight this. If I go this way, I, I can't get close to him. He's got a big shield. Even if I tried throwing something, he can block that with a shield. He's got this scale armor that's huge. I mean, even if I tried, would I pierce it? Could, I mean, like maybe if I got one hit on him, but I'm probably not getting a second. Like, they're looking at this going, I, I can't do this. There's literally nothing we can do against this guy. If you keep reading, and I, I'm not going to go through every single verse here because there, there would be so much and we could spend hours in it, but we're trying to hit the highlights and kind of build to, I think, what the main part of this narrative is. But David shows up because David's older brothers are fighting in the army and David's dad is a good dad. And he's like, hey, I want you to go check on, check on the older brothers. I want to know that they're still okay. So he sends him with some stuff. He goes, when he gets there, he hears Goliath's challenge. He hears it and he's seeing all the reactions and he's like, what are you guys? What's going on? But then we also see here, again, reinforcing everyone else's response in verse 24. After they've heard this, actually, I'll go back to verse 23. As David was talking, as he was talking with them, Goliath the Philistine, champion from Gath, stepped out of his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. So this Goliath has been coming out, we read here, for 40 days. And it seems like he also might be getting closer and closer and closer because nothing's happening, so he's like... I'm getting here, I'm coming. I'm like, where are you? Come at me, I'm here, let's go. And, and so the closer that he gets, they're just like, I'm out, I'm out. I don't wanna be the guy. But now we get to see the contrast in David. Now he responded to this. So we're gonna see that while this threat is real, David's confidence is also real. So starting in verse 32, so David's been there, Saul overhears that this David is kind of like, what's going on? So Saul brings David to him, and David says this to Saul, verse 32. Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. 
which I love this. Like my brain, like I was raised, it shows my age, I was raised watching like the old Looney Tunes cartoons. And so I mean like the old stuff, Bugs Bunny, Elmer Fudd, Daffy. And it reminded me, there was this, there was this like big like bulldog that had this little dog friend. I don't know if you remember this one. And he was like this yippy little, hey, hey, where are we going? Where are we going, guy? Are we gonna do this today? Oh, come on, let's get him, let's get him. And he was like this little kind of yippy, almost like a, like a terrier type deal. And like, that's what I'm thinking. Like David's this little like terrier kind of personality who's like, I'm ready, let's go. What are we doing? Huh? Oh, was that guy? I'll go. I'll go. Send me in, coach. Ooh, me, me, me. Dick me. I'm going. Now, some of us are like, okay, you're just cocky. Tone it down. But we're going to see here, and David's not cocky, and he's not just like this blind cockiness where he's just going to go up and get smacked down. Like, he doesn't think, oh, he's easy. Like, no, no. He sees it. He's not in denial. He's not just pretending this is going to be a, a cakewalk because this isn't actually something to be afraid of. And Saul reminds him of that. What Saul says here is not going to be like, oh, Saul's bending the truth or he's blinded by fear. Like Saul's just going to straight up tell him facts here. So verse 33, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. So Saul's like, David, David, I get it. But let me tell you what's really going. This guy is a veteran. This guy is experienced. This guy has confirmed kills under his belt. This guy is huge. He's been doing this. You haven't. You never done this. And you're still really young. Like it's not going to work. So David though does something else that kind of shows us where the root of his confidence is and and David leans on his experiences. He says this in verse 40, 34. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep, which I love. Like, I want there to be like this pregnant pause and Saul just to be going, uh-huh, where's this going? Like, I'm seeing you picturing a sheep and I hope you know that they're not nine feet tall. Like, what? You, mm-hmm, okay. So David goes on. He says, when a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and killed it. Okay, can we just recognize David is pretty awesome. I mean, like, this dude is so tenacious where he's like, again, I'd go Looney Tunes where, like, that coyote would come and steal the sheep from the sheepdog, and then he'd have to go, like, whack him. So, like, he's going, like, this something's carrying off his sheep, and he's like, not my sheep, hits it, gets the sheep out of the way, and then the animal comes at him, and he's like, let's go. And he says he seized it by its hair. That's like, you didn't just, like, stick it from afar. He's grappling with a lion? He do jujitsu on bears? I mean, like, what the heck? And he kills him. Like, David can also get it done. Like, he, oh my gosh. But... Look at where he, where he credits those victories. He, I mean, this is his personal experience, but he's not just saying, well, I know I've done this. I know I've done this. Verse 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So he's looking even back on his own personal experiences. And he could easily say, oh, well, Saul, let me tell you the technique I used to just kill this bear. I got him in a headlock. I got him, you know, oh, with this lion, I was able to do this, you know, tear it, like whatever he did. But no, no, he's saying, no, no. I've done some cool stuff because God did it through me. God has saved me in these areas in my life. And that's where I think today we we can easily kind of whitewash the hand of God out of our lives when we look at our life and we go, well, I got that job. Well, well, it's because I made that follow-up phone call. That's why I got it. Well, hey, my my relative got better. Well, it's because we finally got him into that clinic and they finally got to see good doctors. Oh man, that relationship got better. Well, well, yeah, but that's because you know because we finally started seeing a counselor and we were really working stuff together, and so that worked. And and we can easily, unintentionally discredit the hand of God in our lives because we can just see. Well, here's what I did. And David, he does the opposite. He goes, "Well, I, 
I know I was the one physically there, but God did it. So, I think this is critical when we understand the confidence that he has in being able to approach this threat where he's never faced a nine foot tall giant who's armed before, but he's saying, but I know what God can do, so I'm gonna trust that God can do something here. So now we go forward, we're gonna get to this end of the story where we see this, this victory is real that he's gonna experience, but it's also gonna be different than expected. So the victory in this moment is real, but it also comes differently. So again, there's a lot of detail here. You need to go back and read 17. But verse 45, David has come out. The, Goliath is like mad that David came. He's like, really? This is it? This is how much you think of me? You're gonna send this guy? Like, this is insulting. But David comes out and has some words. David says to the Philistine, verse 45, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Listen to this confidence, though, in like, this is what's gonna happen. This is where David just clicks it up a notch. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This is the part that the kids' version leaves out a little bit. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. Like, oh, David is the guy who goes from zero to 100 with nothing in between. And he is like a gangster. Like he is like, oh, you're gonna come at me? You're gonna come, okay, this is what you're gonna do? Okay, I'm gonna cut your head off and I'm gonna feed all your dead bodies to the animals. That's what I'm gonna do. And he's got like those crazy eyes probably and you're like, Okay. I mean, you see, actually, this is not uncommon for King David. The rest of his life, he's ready to throw down like that. I mean, sometimes in the wrong situation, his, his default is let's kill him. Like, it, it's a little bad. But this time it works. This time it's good. But this is what we see also. He's going to come and, and look at his motive for coming out and fighting. This is a different motive here. Because he's, he's not coming out and when it, what he's about to say, he's not saying, I'm going to kill you so that my people will be safe from you. He's not going to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strike you down so that the Philistines will finally be defeated and won't be threatening us anymore. Look what he says. After saying he's going to feed their dead bodies to the animals, middle of verse 36, 46, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. David's goal here, his motivation, is that today because of this conflict, my God will be made known. That's, that's what he's coming into this with. He's saying, you, you've, you think this God isn't real? I am here to show you God is here. And he says that they will know that God saves. And he says, but they will, God doesn't save by sword and spear. He's saying, I'm gonna do something and God is gonna do something that he's not gonna save in the traditional way because he's gonna do something that's gonna prove that it's him doing it. That's what's amazing. And, and the rest of the story, it just gets so epic. I wish we could just spend time digging into this because you know, David runs at him. He does like this no scope shot, headshot, takes him down. And then he goes over and in true to his word fashion, he cuts off his head and then takes it up. And you're like, oh, you're carrying that with you for the rest of the longer. Like, he, like this dude is not mine having a severed head with him. Like he is like, nope, I did it. God did it. He's like, oh man. Again, David's pretty freaking cool, but besides that stuff, let's, let's, let's talk for a second about, okay, so what do we really take from this? How do we really grow from this? Well, I think when we read the Old Testament, something that we need to consciously be asking ourselves is, how do I see Jesus revealed in this? And that's not inappropriate because we believe that when God assembled his word and he assembled history and then wrote it down for us, he was intending for us to see what was coming. And he was intending us to take us on a journey in this story. So we go, where's Jesus in this? Or how does this reveal to me the unchanging character of God? And I think what we see in this is in David, we can see a foreshadowing of another unexpected savior. 
who would not fit the description that people were looking for, and who would be proclaiming that God indeed saves, albeit in an unexpected way. And for us, the main giant that Jesus does rescue us from is the giant, is the enemy of our own sin, our rebellion against God. And on the cross, he took it all away so that we don't have to fear death, which is amazing. But even when we step into that relationship with him now through trust, he doesn't immediately just take us into glory. We still have to live here. We still have to struggle. So, so what happens when we're still here and we're facing that giant of that biopsy that just came back positive for cancer? Or we're still facing that giant of that broken, failing marriage or this family relationship? Or that giant of loneliness, this anxiety or maybe depression? How about the giant of debt that's building? Or that job that you lost or the job that you still don't have that you feel like you need? I mean, do we just say, well, I know I don't have to worry. God's got me. I mean, there's something true in there, but how long can that sustain you? How long can that keep you from fear? I think the bottom line of this story and the main lesson that we need to know when we see this is God's rescue comes, but it's in his time, it's in his way, and it's for his glory. So when we look at the problems we're facing, when I said, do you need rescue from something today? When you look at that thing, you have that in your mind, I think we need, when you seek this perspective on it, this is what builds your capacity for trust. When otherwise you might not be able, you think you might not be able to trust him. So if you're, if you're coming up against something like a sickness or disease, well, that's a tough one. And, and you could be praying for a miracle. And that fear is real because it's a real thing. But what, what are your expectations for victory? I know for my family, like we have, we have some dear friends who I went to college with. Some of the other friends are here too. And we know this couple and they have a son who I think is about seven years old and he has brain cancer. And he's been diagnosed for several years now. They've been treating and treating and they thought they beat it, but it's coming back and it's still there. And, and we're praying and we're like, God, won't you know, please take this away. Tried the medicine route and it's kind of working and eventually, then it's like, not that we're losing hope, but we're saying it's maybe an expectation of victory is maybe not the one that we see. Maybe, maybe Jesus' expectation for victory is this little boy gets to see Jesus early. Who knows? Maybe, maybe you're dealing with financial problems. Maybe you're going, why won't, you, why won't you provide for me the way I need you to provide for me? But did, did God show up immediately the second Goliath stepped out there? No. He waited 40 days. And he waited until someone would actually step out and take a step of faith. Because while God's hand, I think, does divinely come into our lives, often he chooses to wait for people of faith to take a step. And sometimes it's so that we can learn a lesson. Hey, how'd you get in this mess? Okay, I'm gonna wait until you learn, and then we're gonna go. Maybe it's a broken relationship and this one's hard where you're going, well, I'm trying to make reconciliation happen. I'm trying to fix this, but this other person, they're just not there. Now, again, the victory that we want to see is I want to see this healed. I want to see it perfect. I want to see us getting along. And that's great, but, but maybe the expectation that we should shift towards is, is how does God want me to display his glory by my actions and attitudes? When this person is not responding, how can I reflect the glory of God and demonstrate his forgiveness and grace? So that no matter what happens in this relationship, my God may be known to the people around me. Maybe that's the expectation we need to have. Again, maybe you're, maybe you're dealing with loneliness, that feeling of community that you're looking for. And maybe God isn't saying, no, I'm not gonna give you a community, but maybe he's saying, the community I have for you is gonna look different than the one you keep looking towards. Maybe you need to try this other group that you wouldn't expect, but they're the ones that I have for you. They're the people who are gonna be the best for you, not just the ones you think you're comfortable with, and maybe it's gonna require you to be vulnerable in ways that you don't feel like you can be, but if you step out, you will find I provide. Or maybe he's also saying, I want you to find your satisfaction in me before you find it in another person. 
There's all sorts of things we could struggle with. And I would say, just remind us that God's rescue does come. But it is in his time. It is in his way. And it's for his glory. So God isn't rushing to defeat your giants. He's not like, he doesn't feel the emergency that we feel. Not because he doesn't care, but because he's looking at it in his perfect timing. And the catch is, our responsibility isn't to passively wait on God, but to actively trust. Where again, we could be like the Israelites who stand there, just wait for something to happen to Goliath because they don't see what, and God's going, nope, I'm going to bring my guy and he's going to do it at the right time. And God isn't bound by the available tools that we see. So you could be looking at your problem going, well, I can see this solution, this solution, and this solution, but none of these three things are happening or they can't happen because of X. And we're like, well, well, then it's not gonna work. And God's going, hey, I have resources that you can't even imagine. I have people that can come in in a moment's notice that you've never looked for, that you wouldn't expect, that you think aren't capable, and I'm waiting for you to trust. So don't limit God by what you can see. And I think most importantly, though, God is waiting to rescue us at the right time and in the way that will give him the most glory. So in our own struggles, I think the place that we want to strive to get to, which is hard even for me to have this focus, but to get to the place where saying, no matter what's going on, my chief goal will be to see God elevated, to see his power demonstrated, to see that whatever he does, it will make him be, look to be as amazing as I know he is. When that becomes our driving goal, I think God then goes, okay, now you're at the point where you can really trust me and you can step out. Now you have the confidence to see this, so no matter what physically happens, this goal will be accomplished. God will be glorified in your life. But let's not demand what that victory looks like. So as we close here, I wanna say like, so what is our response? What are we supposed to do in this? Well, I think we need to trust God And take a step. And you you don't have to know exactly how it's all going to work out. You don't have to have all the answers. But if we know who God is, even if you've experienced just something in your life, but you could see what he's done in other people's lives, trust in the character of our God. Trust in his strength. Trust in his timing. Trust in his methods. And just take that next step in life. Don't sit there paralyzed by fear, but trust our God who comes in in the right time, who sent his Savior at the right time to save us, to give us hope for our life. So trust God and take a step. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can trust you. And I pray, Lord, for anyone in here who is going through something right now, even if they feel like, well, maybe it's small, but whatever thing they're facing, I pray that they they would come to a relationship with you through your son, Jesus. And that through that relationship, they would get to know you, to experience your power in their lives, and to be able to trust in who you are. No matter the outcome, what we expect but I pray that we would all grow and get to the point where we can say just like the apostle Paul said for me to live is Christ and to die is gain Lord give us your perspective thank you for your rescue in your name we pray amen